one. Just in case if somebody needs uh, uh, notepads or pens, uh, you can take them here. Okay, let us uh, resume. Okay, for our second uh, lecture, we are happy to have uh, Laura Donay, and uh, she will tell us about uh, celestial amplitudes. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Recording in progress. I hope the microphone works well enough so that you can hear me at the back. Um, no, it's not working well. I didn't touch it. Uh, I think it's, it's working, but it's just maybe not close enough. Uh, yes, it's working. It's okay? Ma Matteo, I mean, but I, I should speak louder maybe? Okay, so, <laughs> so the microphone is for online and... Uh, <laughs> okay, if you can raise, lo put the volume of the microphone higher the better, so that I don't have to, to shout, but. Okay. Well, let's, let's see, let's see if you can hear me. I will try to speak out. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to see you all here and also uh, hello uh, people online. Um, so I will be, uh, telling you about celestial amplitudes. So celestial amplitude, I will uh, present them as the observables of quantum gravity in flat space times, which, lives on, which live on the conformal sphere at the boundary of flat space time, which is called the celestial sphere. And uh, celestial amplitudes are the, the root of a recent program, which is called celestial holography, and which has been uh, developed, uh, been developing very fast in the in the recent years. So, um, so the goal of this program is to address to which extent uh, we can generalize the holographic paradigm uh, to f space times which are uh, more realistic, namely uh, in this case, which are asymptotically flat. So celestial holography uh, proposes a holographic approach to quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space time. And I will define what I mean by that. Um, and so it's a very uh, precise proposal actually, which is rooted on this celestial uh, amplitude. So celestial amplitudes in this context uh, will play the role of the observables. So they will be actually uh, scattering elements, but written in a, con in a, in a convenient way, uh, such as to exhibit the manifest conformal uh, transformation law under the action of the Lorentz group. So they will be the observables of uh, quantum gravity. And they will be living 
on the celestial sphere. Now we'll recall what is the celestial sphere and what is an asymptotically flat space-time. Um, so this, this, uh, this story and this program is actually uh, now pretty old, and it builds up uh, on, um, on, the, on many observations that have been made in the last years. Basically, the, the main observation is that the infrared structure of gravity in flat spacetimes is much richer, more subtle, and also much less understood than, than we thought uh, it, it, it was. And um, it has to do with the, the, some kind of very deep realization that several aspects of, of uh, physics in flat spacetime are actually deeply connected to each other. Uh, for instance, we will see that uh, the so-called asymptotic symmetries of general relativity uh, can give a symmetry principle for a very uh, known theorem in quantum field theory, uh, which are Weinberg, Weinberg's of theorems. This is just to mention one of the relations that uh, we will go into more details. And um, so it's a, it's a quite long story which builds upon physics did that uh, uh, belong to different topics. But I, as I, I think that that is what is, is very interesting to actually uh, relate all these, uh, all these things together. And of course, uh, so the main goal of this, of this formulation of celestial amplitude has to do with attacking this, this problem of uh, uh, addressing a holography in space-time which is not anti the sitter, but inst instead describe in a more realistic way uh, the kind of space-time we live in. So uh, the motivation for this program, basically the first is to understand the holographic paradigm for a more realistic kind of space-times. So in particular, I mean, we know that the holographic uh, correspondence has given us this, in its uh, uh, most uh, concrete realization, is the ADS anti the sitter conformal field theory correspondence which, establishing, which establishes that quantum gravity in a space-time of anti the sitter, so with negative cosmological constant, can be equivalently described by a theory without gravity, a conformal field theory, that lives at the boundary of the space-time. So this, has, this paradigm has been proven to be extremely uh, powerful, and we would like to, uh, to, to know how we can approach this problem for more realistic space-time, namely for um, flat space-times, which have vanishing cosmological constant. So, of course, Uh, of course, uh, we know that we live in a universe with a positive cosmological constant, um, but uh, the approximation of looking at flat spacetime, vanishing uh, lambda, is a very good approximation for a huge amount of uh, physical ap applications, from collider physics to astrophysical uh, physics, up to uh, scales which are, of course, uh, smaller than cosmological scales. So we know very well uh, how uh, the holographic correspondence works for in, in, in DDS, but for flat spacetime, somehow um, the problem is much less understood, and it has to do with several features that are uh, actually inherent to the to the to flat spacetimes. The fact, for, for instance, that the boundary of flat space is not a time-like Lorentzian boundary, but it's still a null boundary where there is no natural notion of locality or time evolution. Uh, so this presents new challenges that one is not encountered to, 
to face in ADS CFT. Uh, but uh, I don't think that nobody thinks that holography is just a, a, a peculiarity of, of this kind of space time, but that is instead a very rich and broad, uh, a very broad uh, principle uh, for gravity. So we'd better understand uh, to which extent and what we can make uh, in, uh, uh, for, for a more realistic kind of space times. So that's the first uh, motivation is holography basically is, is nice. The, the second one, independently of holographic motivations, I think this program of celestial amplitude and celestial holography is very interesting um, because it, uh, it unveils new and deep connection between uh, several subfields in physics, as I, I have already mentioned. So to mention just a few of these topics, and this is what we will uh, start with uh, today, is the topic of asymptotic symmetries, which is a purely general relativity classical topics uh, in physics, in general relativity, GR. We will also deal uh, with quantum field theory, uh, especially uh, sub theorems that were discovered in the 60s by Weinberg and others. It also has to do um, with more uh, pragmatic uh, topics, as it uh, actually all this this story is beautifully connected to observables in gravitational wave physics. And these are this, the so-called memory effects. So I will not have time to talk much about uh, memory effects, uh, but uh, roughly speaking, these effects are, if you want, the physical consequences of the, of, of, of the fact that we have an infinite amount of symmetries at the boundary of flat space times. And then, uh, as we will see, celestial amplitudes, since we want to... Um, relate this to holographic techniques, we will have to uh, also build some connection uh, with the 2D conformal field theories. So this is for the motivation. Um, so let me uh, define maybe uh, a little bit more concretely what, what we'll, we'll do here and what is uh, celestial holography. So this will be a duality. So it's yet to, to be established between um, gravitational scattering in four dimensions. So I will be working in four dimensional uh, asymptotically flat space times. And a yet to be uh, fully understood dual theory which will be a two-dimensional theory, which I will refer to as a celestial conformal field theory, or a celestial CFT. Sometimes I will denote this by CCFT. So what is a celestial CFT? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, but we will, we will uh, go uh, along this, this, uh, this path together. and. We will see that 
a celestial 2D CFT shares many features with, with the conventional conformal filter in two dimensions, but also, as we will see, very different uh, properties and pu puzzling aspects which, has, which have to do with the fact that we are in flat space times. And people now, it's a, it's a rich program which involves many people coming from many different subfields, from, uh, from scattering amplitudes, from GR, um, and also people are coming uh, from the CFT, uh, CFT uh, background. And all these people are really actively trying to come with a better understanding of what is a celestial CFT, what are the constraints of this theory, what are the list of properties that it should obey, um, and how it encodes gravity in flat space times. So most, more, most conc concretely, what will we do? What we'll do is, what is a celestial amplitude? Is a, uh, is a scattering amplitude, but written in a convenient basis, in which, which exhibit manifestly SL2C and variance. So I will explain this all in detail, but just so that you have an idea. So we will describe the four dimensional sc scattering uh, process. So this is the, the duality uh, proposal in terms of a very different thing. which is a correlation function in this so-called celestial conformal field theory. C, C, F, T, 2. So if you want, it's a 4D bulk, 2D kind of duality, and I will explain why this is an interesting and somehow natural uh, playground for holography in flat space-time. Um, so now on the left hand side I have, a, I have scattering elements in, in 4D bulk. On the right hand side I have correlation functions which involve a bunch of operators living on, this, on, the, on the celestial sphere. And these operators are, will be labeled by these quantum numbers, a conformal dimension delta. And a, two dimension, and a 2D spin, J. So right, I will explain you how this holographic map works in the, in the third uh, chapter of the lecture. But roughly speaking, what we will do is that, um, so I will consider mostly massless, uh, scattering of massless particles. And massless particle can be labeled by a null momenta, which involves the, uh, it's the, the, the energy omega. And what we will do is we will trade this energy for this conformal dimension delta via a precise uh, integral transform, which is called a Mellin transform. And uh, the 2D spin, on the other hand, will be uh, simply uh, identified with the 4D helicity of the particle. Uh, let's call it L. So this will just be identified. So we will trade the energy of the particle for this conformal dimension delta. The spin of the correlation, correlator uh, of the operators will be the helicity of the particle. And the Z and Z bar will label how the particle enter and exit the celestial sphere. So I will explain this in way more details, but it's just to, for you to have a, a broad outlook of what we are going to deal with. So why is it a good thing to do? And what is this, the new, the new, let's say, the new, because there have been several attempts before to, to you know, to, to get some flat space holography from ABS CFT, um, and something did work, so, but most of the things didn't. And the new uh, take of this program is to actually use the huge amount of symmetries that are the boundary of flat space times, which are the so called. Uh, BMS symmetries that I, I will uh, review today. So basically, uh, the new uh, powerful uh, tool of, of, of that we will use, as we saw in the first lecture, symmetries are extremely powerful. 
um, as they, are strong, they will strongly constrain uh, the problem and give an infinite amount of conservation laws in flat space time. And actually, they are now people are slowly understanding that they are much richer um, and also more subtle than, than expected. And the goal is to use, to a full extent, all these symmetries to constrain at maximum this problem and, uh, and the celestial uh, CFT. Actually, we have an infinite amount. We have infinite amount of infinite towers uh, of symmetries. And these provide for us for full constraints. And I will uh, explain precisely how this constraint manifests themselves for conformal field theory. Is there any question on, on the motivation? Yes. Yes. Yes, so it's, a, yeah, right. So it's, it's, it's different from the usual co-dimension one type of holography where we have the CFT living in one dimension lower. Um, and f this is one of the, if you want, unconventional aspect of that. And I will try to explain why actually, so it, it always has to do with what is the natural um, uh, place for the dual theory to live in, right? And, and, and actually you can, you can, uh, you could come with a different, with a different type of holography. This is something actually I'm interested in, into. But um, roughly speaking, we will see that the celestial sphere, which is the conformal sphere at the boundary, which is two dimensional, because of the nature of the scattering process in flat space time, will be uh, naturally playing the role of this holographic screen. It just has to do the fact, in two words, with the fact that the Lorentz group in flat space time acts as the, as the conformal group on the celestial sphere. So if you recast these amplitudes uh, on the celestial sphere by construction, uh, by symmetry uh, construction, these will naturally uh, transform convariantly under SL2C. So you have the conformal group, and then you can wonder how to extend it to the local uh, the, to the local group and, and have a fully fledged uh, 2 d CFT. I will come, of course, to that. But indeed, that's, that's, a, that's a different kind of holography. It's a co-dimension two type. If uh, 4D has three space dimension in one time, the CFT is just Space. Yes, yes. It will be uh, labeled by this angle Z and Z bar. So it's, it's uh, Euclidean if you want. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll see exactly how we start from, uh, from, um, from massless uh, on-shell particle and then how we can uh, extract the, the, the data that they imprint on this 2D, 2D sphere. Thank you. Another question. Uh, just a quick question. So, um, is the celestial CFT related in any way uh, from a limit of the ADS CFT in four dimension? From a flat limit? Yeah, so consider ADS4 CFT3. Is the celestial CFT related in any way by a limit in that uh, you know, ADS4 setup? So, as of now, there is no flat limit process that is uh, giving you. Um, uh, the celestial uh, CFT from a flat space limit or large uh, radius uh, limit. But we know, radius. for example, the S matrix <coughs> from flat space is, can be recovered, like in the interior of ADS, where the curvature can be neglected. Yes. Yeah, so, so um, you, you, this is a very interesting thing to look at, specifically what we can have, what, which kind of uh, relationship we can have, starting from. 
uh, even correlation function in LDS are relating to the one in the celestial sphere story. Some people have started to look at this, but this is something that is not uh, fully understood. And there are actually many reasons why uh, this problem is complicated because actually to, to I think that my take on that is that to have a chance that this works, you have to really strongly somehow relax some of the assumptions that we usually do in ads -CFT, and one of them is the so-called boundary condition and the boundary which are bouncing. Here we will have to allow for outcoming flux. I will come to that when I will talk about BMS symmetries, but we have to allow for way more uh, relaxed uh, uh, boundary condition in ADS to, to be able to do this map properly. Thank you. Yeah, as you said that uh, flat space time is a good approximation for our universe in some uh, regimes. Mm -hmm. But the conformal boundary between positive cosmological constant and zero cosmological constant is non trivially different. So, yes, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And indeed, if, if I uh, once I will tell you what I can, uh, what I know about this, it's it's far from obvious how will it can tell us about, you know, DS-CFT correspondence. So, so this is another actually interplay that we might be able to, to come at with uh, at some point because indeed uh, the, the, the serial space time is also very peculiar. But actually there are very reminiscent, we will see there are very reminiscent feature of funky things that happen in the CIDR also appear in, in celestial holography. So there are some, some, some stuff in common. There's another question there. I will start writing and don't take it bad, but it's just. Uh, so would the CFT uh, live in uh, uh, the asymptotic infinity in what sense? Uh, in the sense that uh, does it live on uh, the spatial infinity I0 or on some uh, fixed slice of uh, scry plus or scry minus? Yeah, it will live on the celestial sphere. And uh, now I will uh, precisely explain uh, what are all these locations you are talking about? Spatial infinity, mm. the non-infinity, the celestial sphere, okay. and uh, this will be clear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. If there is anything else, let me know. Also, if you have a question online, uh, let me know. So 2.1, well, let, let's start with uh, recalling all this, the structure of flat space-time, and in particular, what is an asymptotically flat space-time. So I'm supposed to stop at 12.45, right? Yes. Okay. So let's, let's start with something you all know, which is exactly flat space-time, namely the Minkowski metric in four dimensions. Have a T. The time coordinate, the radial coordinates, and the sphere angles. Let's take for the moment t times phi. So this is just Minkowski. Now I'll be I will be using a lot in this lecture a new time coordinate. Uh, let me write all this. Let me keep some here. Some uh, retarded time coordinate uh, u, which is simply the difference of, the, of t minus r. And very importantly, I will be also using um, complex stereographic coordinates in place of, in place of instead of this theta and phi angle, which are the Z and Z bar coordinate, which will pop up a lot in these lectures. So they can be obtained by taking E to the I phi cotangent of theta over two. And Z bar is the complex conjugate of Z. So it's E to the minus I phi cotangent theta over two. So in these uh, maybe somehow unusual coordinates, 
the Minkowski line element just take this following form, minus du squared minus 2 du dr plus 2 r squared this gamma z z bar thing here, this z z bar, where gamma z z bar is just the unit sphere metric here, but now written in complex coordinates. 2 over 1 plus z z bar squared. So this is just the unit sphere metric. And now let me draw a very important uh, diagram, which is a Penrose diagram. for Minkowski space. So Penrose diagram is uh, bringing, bringing the infinities of a space-time to a finite distance. And an important thing about this diagram is that light rays and massless particles always propagate along lines of uh, 45 degrees. So. So time is, sorry, this is time here, R. So this is the trajectory of, of, of a massless particle in this diagram. So a massless particle follows a null geodesic and uh, basically let me, uh, let me draw here. Um, so what is a bit weird is like con constant, constant R curves in these space times are like that. So these are constant radial coordinates curves and constant time slices are here in blue. So these are T equal constant in this diagram. So I'm not recalling how you make the change of coordinates to an, how you make the conformal compactification. I, by the way, you can, a good reference for, for this, this uh, lecture is a Strominger lecture note, which is, uh, which are on archive. Uh, so in this diagram, uh, the null coordinates U is going in this way. Very good. And so in each, in each, actually each point of this diagram is actually a two-dimensional sphere. Well, it's, it's not exactly, it's a half a sphere which is mapped to, to, the, to the other, to the other, other side, but let me be a bit sketchy and we, you can ask more about that after if you're interested, but basically each point in this diagram is a two-sphere which is labeled by this uh, angle Z and Z bar. Very good. Uh, so there are different locations uh, in this diagram. So one I was just asked is this, uh, this place is called spatial infinity, I zero. Spatial infinity is the place you reach when you take R going to infinity and T constant. Um, you have a past time like infinity and future time like infinity. I will not talk much about that, but uh, basically, um, this is the location where massive particle uh, and their life. So, a massive particle will have this kind of trajectory in in flat space, and it ends its life here at I plus, which is future time like infinity. So which is obtained when you take T infinity. But since I will be dealing mostly with massless, uh, scattering of massless particles, I will be especially interested in uh, this null hypersurface here which is a null hypersurface, which is called uh, future null infinity. Uh, 
and denoted by this letter calligraphic I scry plus. This is quite plus because this is the future, but there is a past analogous of this look, of this hypersurface, scry minus, which is past null infinity. I hope you can read something on this diagram. If something is not clear, just, just let me know. Um, good, so what is the celestial sphere and where, where will our theory be living? So let me erase uh, this Minkowski line element. So, um, so as I said, each point here in this diagram is a, is a two-sphere. Uh, so topologically, future null infinity is a real line which is spined by this uh, coordinates u times the two sphere. And this sphere is called the celestial sphere. Yeah, I, call, I write this uh, CS2. Maybe sometimes I will write this CS. Yeah, let's, let's keep it like that. I don't promise I will be consistent all the way through, but. Um, so it's really, uh, it's really the, the sphere that you, you can see uh, when you look at the night sky, approximating that we, we live in a flat, uh, flat space times, but this is, this is nothing but the, the celestial sphere, it's just the sphere you can uh, see at night. Um, so that's flat space times. And this is the conformal uh, compactified version of this flat space time with this uh, Penrose diagram. So the important thing about that that I, I want you to focus on is that massless particles propagate along 45 degrees and end their life here on this null hypersurface, which is called future null infinity. And, and the massless particles also come from another location, which is the past non infinity. So there are different ways to draw, this, to draw this diagram. Sometimes people draw the version which is a triangle, but I found this one, this one is, is less confusing. So this is uh, just Minkowski. Now we'll be interested in uh, more generic kind of space times, which are the so-called uh, asymptotically flat space times. So roughly speaking, an asymptotically flat space-time is, as you might guess, some, a space-time that looks like Minkowski seen from very far away. And this is indeed what it is. But there is a precise definition of what we mean by looking like Minkowski from, from far away. And this definition is given us by the seminal work of Bondi, Van der Berg, Metzner. Uh, Van der Berg is always dropped for some reason. Let's, let's put it back for once. Van der Berg. Namely, BMS. So these guys, they make a very important piece of work in the, in the 60s. So these guys are general, relativistic, uh, general relativity people. And at that time, there were people where it was not very clear whether gravitational waves in GR actually also uh, uh, actually existed. And they wanted to make uh, some work that were to prove the existence of gravitational waves uh, at nonlinear level. And this led them to define this so-called asymptotic uh, flat space time. So, what is that? Well, in the first uh, approximation, this is a flat space time, so it will be given by the Minkowski line element that I have written before. This is just Minkowski, plus some correction, which will be uh, tamed uh, away as R is very big. So this will be a large radius expansion 
Um, and there is a precise uh, prescription for, for this. And this will be important, so. So we are doing uh, a large R perturbation of flat space time. I'm writing some stuff in, in, in green and in red, and then I will explain what these are. What I can already tell you before I forget is that this big D capital, well, with an index Z of Z bar, is the covariant uh, derivative with respect to uh, the sphere matrix, so gamma Z Z bar, which raises and lowers Z and Z bar indices. And also sometimes you will catch me using this notation, big, big A, just to denote collectively uh, the angles Z and Z bar. So we have a few terms here, but remarkably not so many. Uh, not so many terms that we need to add. And this will be uh, good enough for, for these lectures. So I have dz of dzz, czz. So I'm writing here just one holomorphic component, but I have the complex conjugate. So this cc means complex conjugate, where everything I've written is copied, but putting z bar instead of z. And then we have plus dot dot dot. Plus dot 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 meaning uh, some subleading corrections in these one of our expansions. Okay. So what is that, and what are these functions in uh, green and in red? So let me explain that, and then. You can ask me some questions. So this, this function m here is called the bandy mass aspect. And this, this uh, nz here, there is also an nz bar, is called the angular momentum aspect. So what are these? Well, roughly speaking, as their name suggests, M just encodes the total energy of the system you're describing, and, and Z has to do with the angular momentum of, of, this, of the thing you're describing. So if you take a, a Kerr metric, just a Kerr metric black hole solution, you write this in, into these coordinates, you will see that this m here is just nothing but the mass of the black hole. So in this case, it's just a constant, but here I'm allowing for more generic kind of space times because I'm allowing this function to depend arbitrarily on the retarded time and the angles. Uh, and the angular momentum aspect will be, of course, related to the angular uh, uh, momentum of, of, the, of the curved black hole if you were to expand this uh, solution into these coordinates. But you see, I'm considering a much more generic uh, kind of uh, setup, which is uh, this BMS asymptotically flat space time. And this function here in red is the asymptotic shear of null geodesic congruence, asymptotic shear for short. And it's very important because it, it's, it's present, it's telling you whether the system you are uh, describing is emitting gravitational waves. So in particular, you, if you define this, so here I'm using uh, AB as collectively for Z and Z bar. 
this object, which is the retarded time derivative of the shear, is called uh, the new tensor. And so it encodes outgoing, the presence of outgoing radiation. So this is very important. <clears throat> now, why have I written this in red and why this in green? Well, the difference between these uh, two things is that Einstein's equation implies some um, evolution equa or constraint equation on the bounding mass and the angular moment to mass spec. So roughly speaking, if you solve Einstein's equation order by order in R, you will see that the time derivative of M is constrained to be something. And uh, similarly uh, for N, Z, and at Z bar. On the other hand, uh, this CAB here is not constrained, so it's really a, a data, a free data that you put in the theory. So it's qualitatively uh, uh, different than, than the other two things. And so basically, uh, roughly speaking, it encodes the uh, two polarization modes of the of the strain uh, measured by a gravitational wave detector at very large distance. And just, just then, then I will stop writing thing and I will take questions, but just to explain a little bit more physically what's, what this metric mean. So, there is this very famous formula Uh, which is called the Bondi formula, but actually it was also found by Trotman. I, I heard recently a bit before Bondi. There is this very important formula, which is explaining a little bit what's, what's going on here. So it's telling you, basically, that the integrated version on the sphere of the mass aspect decreases in time. And the reason why it's decreasing in time, uh, it's because there is gravitational waves that, which is escaping the system. So it's very easy to understand. You have some, some gravitational system uh, which is emitting gravitational waves. The wave is escaping uh, through null infinity and as a consequence, the energy decreases. So this formula was the first, actually, uh, theoretical evidence for the existence of gravitation waves at non-linear level. Is there any question on this diagram on the definition of asymptotically flatness or on these functions? Yeah, just a trivial notational question. So just to be sure. So C A B, uh, the non-zero uh, components are just C Z Z and C Z Z C bar C Z bar Z bar. There's no C Z Z yeah, bar. Yeah, component. no, it's, yeah, it's symmetric and traceless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So indeed. We'll have C Z Z or and said C Z bar Z bar. So yeah. So these are the encodes the two polarization, degrees of freedom basically. So why there is no energy coming in from the past? You only oh, have yes, energy Oh, yes, there is. I am sorry. They, they, they can be in going. So everything I've, I've, I'm, I'm writing can be also written for incoming, um, uh, incoming waves. So in this case, thank you for the question. So in this case, uh, we will use a different set of coordinates. We'll use an advanced coordinate, V which is now T plus R. 
which is running here along this now personal infinity. And everything I have written can be repeated for incoming, uh, incoming wave uh, in terms of these advanced uh, coordinates. So here I'm really doing all the analysis at one boundary. And we will see later how, actually, when we will want to talk about the scattering problem, how the data, the past and the future are related to each other. But it is, I'm focusing on outgoing uh, gravitational uh, waves for just the sake of, I could re you could repeat everything in, in advance. And in the lecture note of Andy, you can find uh, the relevant formulas. Hi. Uh, uh, yes. Is there any specific uh, conditions on Riemann tensor that the asymptotic flatness, uh, this asymptotically flat space-time should follow? Like, uh, what, what are the conditions on Riemann tensor for so asymptotic? We just say that it's, 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 it's flat, basically. That the, you, you, will, you can solve the Einstein's equation, and you will see that. Uh, no, no, but, but uh, after Einstein equations, yeah. there will be some conditions coming from uh, uh, this uh, Riemann tensor, right? So, uh, like, uh, there's some this uh, electric components or magnetic components of uh, sorry, wild tensor. I meant wild tensor. So ah yeah uh, yeah, yeah okay. So, so, so the, what are the, some specific um, conditions uh, yes, on wild tensor? Yes. So basically, here um, this expansion, the fact that I am um, making an expansion in R in the Taylor expansion in R. Uh, and you see, for instance, I didn't include log of r. I could have put some log of r in principle. But basically, this expansion is in, I will not say one-to-one -one because there might be some subtlety arising, but basically is, is, um, is almost equivalent to the peeling theorem uh, in GR, so which is telling you that the vial tensor has certain precise fall-off uh, in, in one over r. So these, these things satisfy Peeling theorem. Now, if you talk to a mathematical GR guy, they will tell you, yeah, but we know there are solutions that do not satisfy Peeling and so on and so forth. But, uh, and this is a, a good comment, but here, basically, I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm assuming there is a conformal compactification holding and all this, uh, but this is good enough uh, and actually very excellent for what we want to discuss. So there are precise fall-off on, on the vial. All right. Am I allowed to use part, uh, time of the discussion? No, I'm not allowed. To, uh, <laughs> okay. Then I will have to um, to tell you uh, what are BMS symmetries in the few minutes remaining. But now we have introduced most of the thing we will we will need. And sorry for the GR detour to amplitudes, but it's, if we don't do that, we will not understand where this theory is living, what are these coordinates, and uh, why the, why, where this, the constraint on the celestial safety come from. So let's go to BMS symmetries. So what we want to look for so we want to answer the question, what is the symmetry group of uh, asymptotically flat space-time? The symmetry group of flat space-time, we know, it's, uh, it's Poincaré. But now we are looking at a bigger, uh, or if you want, more relaxed kind of version of, of flat space-time. And it's not clear what are the symmetries that would preserve such an expansion. Uh, so what we want to look for we will look for infinitesimal vector fields uh, of this type. Psi, this I'm just writing down all components because I'm, I'm nice. So we, wa we want to uh, look for these kind of vector fields which preserve uh, these asymptotic expansion. 
So this is the lead derivative alongside of the metric. And we will ask this not to be exactly zero. That would be looking for a killing vector. We don't want that. We want something that preserves uh, the asymptotic structure. So we want to ask two things. So the, the two rules of the game we want to play is we want to preserve uh, the fall of conditions and the gauge fixing. I didn't talk about the gauge fixing. There are some, it's actually important. There is some gauge fixing in the metric. But if you are interested in that, you can ask me. But what, so this is what we, we cannot do is to mess up with this, uh, these powers of R here. We don't want to introduce the R to the two here or something like that. We want to keep the, the, ex, the, the expansion like that. But what we can do is we can change this function uh, in green and blue, in uh, and red. So we can change the bounding mass, the angular momentum aspect, and the shear. This we can do. Um, and when, we, uh, when you follow this, this game, what you find as a solution is the following vector field. So it's given by a certain function t, depending on the angles, plus u over 2 divergent of, the, of some y. So what is this y? Here, yz is, well, it's basically the, the z components of this vector field. So y only depends on z, I will explain that. And there is another and a similar story for the anti-holomorphic piece. And there is an expression for xi r, but this is not important what it is. What is important in this is that this t is an arbitrary function of its argument. And that um, y, y a, so which is y z, y z bar, is a conformal killing vector on the on the on the celestial sphere. So you, you can write the conformal kin equation for this vector field. I will not. So what I, I want to uh, tell you here is try to convince you that these symmetries are very rich. And this is what people call, so the fact that t, this function, is arbitrary is what led people to call these symmetries uh, BMS super translations. So I know this is the super string school, but this super here has nothing to do with that. <laughs> this super. Um, just means the following. It just means that we have an enhancement of symmetry uh, where uh, the four global translations of, of Poincaré, they include in particular these, these four translations, uh, but also uh, so they are enhanced. There are many, many more. There are actually an infinite amount of them because this thing is an arbitrary function of the sphere. So you have an infinite way to generate them to uh, these uh, infinite dimensional uh, 
super translation. So the super just means that uh, you have an infinite amount of, of translation on the celestial sphere. So this is actually very, it was very, very surprising for, for Bondi, Messner, and Zach when they found this symmetry structure. Because what they wanted to find, they wanted to recover the Poincaré group, namely the isometric group of flat spacetime. That would ma have made sense. But instead, they were stick, uh, stuck with, with the appearance of, a, of an arbitrary function here, and they were really pissed. They said, okay, what is this function? We don't want that. We, we want this to uh, span just the four global uh, translations. So, and they really tried hard to kill this function. They really tried hard by imposing stronger boundary conditions. But they, what they realized is that as soon as they wanted to kill this function, what they were doing actually it was to kill all gravitational radiation. So uh, they came to a conclusion, okay, I mean, it seems that if you want to end uh, uh, radiation, we have to allow for, for these symmetries. Uh, and then people really didn't know what to do with that. Um, until um, in the early 2010, where uh, Andy Strominger and collaborators realized that not only these symmetries have to be there, but that they encode in a very powerful way uh, things that were known from a totally different perspective in quantum field theory, which was known as sub-theorems. And I will tell you about, about that um, tomorrow, how these symmetries are actually extremely uh, powerful. And I don't have much time to talk about these conformal killing vectors here because I'm running out of time. But basically, uh, let me just say in one word that if you ask uh, these, these y's to be globally well-defined, you will uh, you will find the six Lorentz transformations, three rotations and three boosts. But if you relax this assumption, namely, uh, you allow for the Y's to be meromorphic functions, so you allow for local singularities, Then you have a similar enhancement of symmetries where uh, the six Lorentz transformations, well, as you know, in CFT2 are enhanced to a local version of that, uh, which is the local, uh, which are the local uh, transformations and which span uh, two copies. So Y and Y bar span two copies of the Vera Zorro algebra, or more precisely, the Witt algebra, which is the Vera Zorro uh, algebra without central extension, because we are at the level of the fields, of the vector fields here. And sometimes people this, uh, call these super rotations. And this was, uh, these were advocated much later by Glenn Barnish and Cédric Troussart in around 2008, I think. So this is a much more general uh, recent story that is motivated actually uh, from, holographic, uh, uh, from a holographic point of view, and I will come back to that. So uh, let me stop here for today and take your questions. Yeah, let us thank Laura for that. Recording stopped.